at a young age that life is too short to be miserable the majority of your waking hours. At 17 years old, the day before I uh, graduated high school, I was diagnosed with a blood disorder that became so severe that at one point I was actually told I had two years to live. Obviously, that diagnosed was reversed. I've had people question that. Um, <laughs> and, and I forged headlong in the beginning of my college career. Uh, two years later, into my summer job, about six weeks into my summer job, while working at a Methodist summer camp, my ministry teammates and I found ourselves hiding out in a cabin for about three days until we could report our abusive boss to the authorities. Fast forward until I uh, finished undergrad and got my first job working as a program director with a different denomination. And I had a boss, also a minister, who told me anecdotes about the size of his penis on three different occasions. <laughs> Good time. Um, the final straw, the last straw, was when I walked into a dinner party and he greeted me by yelling across the kitchen, have your tits gotten bigger? Good times. It's a good laugh, y'all. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, it's very healing, I'll tell you that. Now, these were just a few of my experiences, and they weren't even the worst ones. But this was also my introduction, or dec almost decades-long introduction, to what I call bad bosses. Last year, like many of y'all, I started hearing about movements like Me Too and Time's Up. There was this particular watershed moment where I was, uh, my husband's right there, he can probably attest to this. He's a very tolerant man. Um, I'm standing in our living room watching the top news story of the day about a bad boss. Somebody like many of y'all, I'd never heard the name before, Harvey Weinstein. His story was the tsunami in a flood of workplace sexual harassment and assault cases that took down big names like Matt Lauer and Bill Cosby. As I stood there <coughs> watching news story after news story across a variety of networks, no two, the capitalistic, business-owning entrepreneur inside my head was becoming infuriated. In all the reporting, no one was actually complaining or commenting on the work time wasted by the perpetrator. Now, don't get me wrong. I am in no way trying to minimize the horrific impact on victims of sexual harassment and assault. Today, I actually want to show you where sexual harassment, issues like sexual harassment and workplace discrimination, issues that are typically packaged as social issues, are actually pro-economic issues that support capitalistic values. Hang with me for a second. In September 2006, Facebook opened up membership to everybody, not just college students, launching one of the biggest workplace distractions in history, now known as social media. I know we're all guilty. <laughs> About, let's say, jump forward 10 years later and include smartphones in that, and last year, 2017, the U.S. Department of Labor came out with a study and they showed that uh, some of you might have heard this, they showed that the average full-time employee wastes eight hours a week on their smartphone. Okay. Here's the thing. In every other aspect, we're tracking the data related to perpetrators of workplace slacking. So why have we not been tracking the work time wasted by perpetrators who, instead of doing their work, were you know, harassing and assaulting their co-workers. And in addition to not doing his work, the victimized employee is much less productive, traumatized, or like me, leave their job and their uh, industry altogether. I looked back, that was a question I posed to myself, I looked back, and the EEOC actually ran the statistics, and the numbers that they best can average is about one in four people are victims of sexual harassment in the workplace. So what that's telling us is perpetrators are negatively influencing the productivity of at least 25% of our entire workforce. On one hand, people are taking to the streets with enormous passion about important social issues, myself included. 
but we often fail to convey the operational, financial, and strategic details that actually bolster the, the details about those social issues that actually influence our businesses. On the other hand, earlier this spring, I was sitting in a South Carolina forum for gubernatorial candidates for South Carolina, and as I was sitting there, I kept hearing conservative candidates say the phrase over and over, you know, we have to let the free market work and, um, and, and encourage our competitive businesses. However, when pressed, conservative candidates refused to admit that there were even hiring biases or workplace discrimination. One candidate kept actually even repeating, I believe in hiring and promoting based on talent. Here's the thing. You can't do that with biases blocking your view of an amazing potential employee, and an employee can't be great with a boot on their neck. Y'all, we have to stop assigning shame to biases. <clears throat> we all have them. I am extremely biased towards my husband. Right, babe? Right, Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't trained up. He's awesome. What we have to be ashamed of, he's adorable. What we have to be ashamed of is not enacting ways to adjust for them. All right, I double check. We got lots of good stuff here. If you do not attempt to remedy discriminatory practices in your business, you're not smart. You're a coward and probably a less profitable one. Hang with me. I'm asking everyone, begging everyone to meet me in a place where issues like sexual harassment and discrimination in the workplace are actually, are, are actually business issues that can help companies uh, increase, or excuse me, boost profit margins, reduce major expenditures, and even infuse millions of dollars back into our local, state, and national economies. I'll actually show you all that later. I'm trying to get everybody to a place where issues that are typically Democrat and liberal, leftist, are and should be of utmost importance <coughs> to right-wing, pro-business, Republicans, and vice versa. I want to get, to get us to a place where all people and all profits, excuse me, a place where we're not hurting all people and all profits. My business um, tends to, I work with clients, I'm a career coach, I work with clients and the typical or the three main issues that tend to come up are sexual harassment, hiring biases and discrimination, and then workplace or managerial abuse. Even though my work tends to be more qualitative than quantitative, all of my daily work it correlates with basically everything we see in the research. I get you there. Okay, there we go. Last year, uh, Nilla for Merchant published an amazing article in the November Harvard uh, Business Review about, it's called The Insidious Economic Impact of Sexual Harassment. What we found, or what she stated was, the numbers show that 85% of women report that they've been sexually harassed at work. I'm gonna jump past one. There we go. Some scaled back their ambitions, but approximately 80% of those women left their jobs within two years. After the whole kitchen yelling incident, I quit and went to grad school. Um, and so my story may sound rare, but apparently it's far from it. I'm a freaking statistic. I always knew I was going to be something. <laughs> I will actually never be able to put a price on what leaving that job cost me, although I am still paying for grad school. Um, <laughs> and I won't actually be able to put a price on what those, those businesses or organizations lost, because I was going to do great things there. As a matter of fact, morale was so bad that within nine months of me leaving the job, six other co-workers of mine followed suit. That was only seven, or excuse me, that was seven of the organization's professional and administrative staff, almost half of, of that professional administrative staff, left representing over $300,000 in annual asset value based on pay alone. Think about that. If your warehouse cost $300,000, would you just sit back and watch it burn? Companies are so much more afraid to fire a predator 
than to actually work to keep and retain good employees. I'll check. Oh, we got lots of good data. Uh, so what happens when somebody leaves their job? Costs companies tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, earlier this spring, before the gubernatorial thing, um, earlier this spring, I got to testify in front of the South Carolina Senate Judiciary Subcommittee, long word, and about a bill that passed with bipartisan support, yay, called the Pregnancy Accommodations Act. This was blushing, the Pregnancy Accommodations Act. Um, senators' mouths literally dropped open, and I really did think that was just a just a, um, a euphemism or something, and I was like, oh wow, they actually did drop open. When I showed them the numbers based on a study done by SHRM, the Society for Human Resource Management, about the cost of turnover. So they took 18 different data points related to things like when a person leaves that job, how many days that job stays open, the cost of lost productivity, and the days to onboard a new employee. What they found, and they based their study on the average, um, a average registered nurse's salary and benefits of $75,000. And what they found, yay, was the total one-time cost of turnover for that position was, position was $41,000. Yeah, that was a lot. In addition to things like the uh, uh, Pregnancy Accommodation Act, Things like that that have been acted in other states we're actually finding have more positive economic impact than previously expected. So what, you know, in addition to saving our money on turnover, we're actually, companies are actually, actually now finding comfort and protections within the parameters that are now well defined and are reducing, if not limit, uh, eliminating completely litigation costs that used to arise from people like getting fired because they got pregnant. Still happens. It's also reducing insurance costs because healthy pregnancies. It's reducing taxpayer expenditures because we no longer have unemployment, therefore it's reducing costs for public assistance that would have arisen from that. Policies like this are of little to no cost to the employer, and heaven forbid, we protect the life and health of the mother and child. So I've been mentioning this word discrimination. Let's define it in its legal terms. Those designations underneath Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, 1964 Civil Rights Act, and subsequent amendments, things like race, religion, and sex. Now, a lot of the studies that are most popular about discrimination and, and discriminatory hiring biases, y'all probably heard of. Some of the more famous ones are about names, like ethnic and gender <laughs> identifying names on resumes. But as a violinist myself, my favorite study, I am really a nerd, Okay, um, my, as a violinist, my favorite study is called uh, uh, Orchestrating Impartiality, the Impact of Blind Auditions on Female Musicians. So in national orchestras, they went in and they put up a screen. I'm probably very good. No. Okay, uh, they put up a screen that would conceal candidates or the musicians that went in, and, uh, and that would conceal <laughs> them from the judges. So what they found was, when that happened in the first round, in the preliminary round, that actually advanced women's, or increased the likelihood of a female advancing to the second round by 11 percentage points. When they used a screen for blind auditions for the final round, it increased the likelihood of a female musician being hired by 30%. Now, my favorite thing about this study is that when the researchers were talking to the judges, the judges said, Oh, we'll totally be able to tell if it's a male or a female musician. And I had a really crude joke for that, but they wouldn't let me tell. <laughs> uh, here's the thing. Oh, I want to make sure I don't a little bit. We got lots of data in this thing. That's good stuff. Again, hiring biases exist, they have always existed as humans. They always will exist. Here's the thing though, the judge's own words and the data shows that there was a gender bias that would have prevented them from hiring the best musicians and having the best talent. We have to start eliminating and you know, at least adjusting for those things. Otherwise your business's competitiveness and profitability will suffer. Case in point, my sweet mother, 
Hey, Mom. I know she's watching. Um, my sweet mother graduated uh, in 1971 at three years old. She graduated in 1971 with her bachelor's degree in mathematics. She's a smart cookie from Virginia Tech as part of the first class of, of graduates from Virginia Tech to have females graduating in other programs outside of home economics. That makes sense. Like most of us, she went out and immediately started looking for a job. And she was told point blank by Shell Oil and John Hancock, we don't hire women. Those two companies lost out on a brilliant computer programmer who went on to write code that helped make companies millions of dollars. If you really are a capitalist, if you really want to crush the competition, if you really want to be the dominant producer of whatever product or service you provide, you have to have the best talent, period. <sighs> I hear a lot of times, and y'all may have heard this complaint too, that affirmative, affirmative action laws and policies born of the Civil Rights Act offer unfair and unearned advantages to people. Let me be very clear. The Civil Rights Act worked to remove barriers made from biases and open up the market on competition. It was a law designed to open up competitiveness regardless of your sex, religion, or, or race. Do y'all know in my, with my clients who I have the most conversations with or who brings me the most worry or complaint about discrimination in the hiring process? White men over the age of 50. It's interesting. Here's the thing. Thanks to the Civil Rights Act, they have the coverage and protections provided for age discrimination beginning at 40. Here's the thing. We have to start seeing people as people and not expendable commodities. We're already seeing that in the opioid crisis. Um, I think I have a Richard Branson. Yes. One of the things about that I love about Richard Branson is he gets it. Mr. Entrepreneur Billionaire understands the value of people. Two of my favorite quotes. One, train people well enough that they can leave, but treat them well enough that they don't want to. And my ultimate favorite, if anybody has ever worked in retail, you will love this. Come on. Bueller. Really? No. Bueller. Okay. There you go. Let's blame Alex. Clients do not come first. Anybody that's worked in the customer facing field is going to be, can attest to this. Clients do not come first. Employees come first. If you take care of your employees, they will take care of your clients. Thank you, so Rich, Sir Richard Branson. I so want to be friends with him one day. Okay, so we have to start pe seeing people as people, not expendable commodities. We're seeing this in the opioid crisis already. People, our opioid addictions begin when people have no other choice but to work injured, work sick, or work exhausted just to make ends meet. There's actually, the Japanese actually have a, um, a word called karoshi, which literally translated means occupational or to our occupational sudden mortality or work death. The major causes of Karoshi are heart attack and stroke due to stress and a starvation diet. People are literally working themselves to death and it's so common, they actually have a word for it. After almost a decade of working with job seekers, it amazes me how long people will tolerate horrid conditions, abusive staff, and bad bosses. I guess the devil you know, especially from my experience, does seem better than the devil you don't. But trust me when I tell you, if you're experiencing a bad boss, I know it feels like you may be trapped in a bubble, but I promise you, don't listen to it, turn off your TVs, there are, there are, you have so many more options and so much more power than, you, than people have in years. <coughs> anyway, in 2008, 
we had this thing called the economic crash, right? It left people traumatized in ways that I still see 10 years later in my business every day with my clients. But for some reason, we've kind of ignored that or it's not acknowledged among the masses. And that was 2008. But here's the thing. In two, or three years later, February 2011, was the first year since the economic crash where more people, 2 million more people, actually left their jobs voluntarily over the people that had been laid off you know, due to all due to the recession. So it was the first month that the pendulum was swinging back the other way in jobs growth. And that was over seven years ago, you guys. Last year, this one over there, uh, last year, the South Carolina Women's Rights and Empowerment Network commissioned a study from the USC Darla Moore School of Business, go Cox, and called Solving South Carolina's Labor Shortage, y'all, we have a labor shortage, increasing, or excuse me, the economic impact of increasing women's participation in the workforce. What they found is in the next decade, South Carolina will need as many as 26,140 additional employees. Y'all, that is 5.2, well, yeah, that's great. Um, there you go. Yeah, that's $5.2 billion in new economic activity every year, and that's just for one state. Imagine what that could do on a national or global scale. <sighs> Y'all, we have to start eradicating biases and discriminatory practices in our businesses that are preventing barriers to entry, or we're gonna be in big trouble. Truth is, we're all scared. It's been a doozy of a couple of years, y'all. Heck, it's been a doozy of a couple of months. We're all trying to find comfort in a theory. I, I understand that. We're trying to find comfort in a theory, capitalist or socialist, or a political party, Democrat or Republican or even a team color, red or blue, in the vain hope that we could possibly make sense of all this chaos and control it. But under the fear, under all the vitriol, under all the philosophies, rhetoric, and loyalties, we have to see the middle ground. And y'all, there is a middle ground. So I'm asking people, begging people, to meet me in a place where our social issues are our business issues where, heaven forbid, we want our businesses and the people within them to thrive. A place where legislative policies and corporate practices provide equity that foster healthy, well-educated, and productive people, citizens, and economic contributors. Y'all, in order for economic prosperity and humanity to actually work, they have to coexist. We have to move past party labels, step out from behind economic theories that only exist in a vacuum, and silence the frightened voice in our head that is threatened by anyone different than us. We have to begin to see people as fully human with all of the enormous potential therein. It is the only way we will find true prosperity in every single sense of the word. Thank you.